everyone. Thank you for joining us today for today's online talk, which will be start starting shortly at 11 a.m. For those who are of you who are here early, thank you for waiting patiently. While you're waiting, we would like to share with you a short video of our firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on the bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website and we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realised before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Thank you for joining us for today's talk entitled dealing with the impact of the movement control order on commercial contracts. My name is Felicia Tang. I'm an associate with Ma Wing Kwai and Associates, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's talk, let me introduce the firm and what we do. Ma Wing Kwai and Associates is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Dato Ma Wing Kwai. Our ABLE team today comprises 22 lawyers and a support team of 19. Datuma is today a consultant of the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with small medium enterprises, family businesses, and individuals. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department, a dispute resolution department, including litigation, adjudication and arbitration, a dedicated employment and industrial relations team, a department focused on servicing the needs of families and individuals. Our firm has five practice groups and our practice groups indicate some of our focus areas which are supported by talent from both our corporate and dispute resolution team. Today's talk is part of our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. But with the COVID-19 movement control order, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, and in-house in counsel. This is our 12th talk in our online talk series, which have been attended by some 2,414 attendees, attendees. Today, we're expecting 296 people who have registered. Please visit our website at maoingkwai.com for more information, to read our articles, 
and to sign up for more upcoming talks. Allow me to introduce the speakers for today. First up, we have Ms. Cassandra Tomazios. She is a senior associate in our corporate department. She holds a Bachelor of Laws from Notambria University. She was called to the English Bar in 2011 and was thereafter admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2012. She also holds a master's degree in transnational law from King's College London. Cassandra focuses primarily on commercial and corporate matters, drafting corporate project agreements, and M&A transactions. Our next speaker, Mr. Tommy Wong, is an associate in our co corporate department. He holds his Bachelor of Laws from the University of Hertfordshire. He was called to the English Bar in 2017 and was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2019. Tommy also focuses primarily on corporate and commercial matters, drafting of corporate project agreements and M&A transactions. We have a Q&A session at the end of this pre presentation. If you have any questions, please don't forget to post it up on Slido or in the chat box here. And we will address them at the end once our speakers are done with their presentation. You can access the Slido page by scanning the QR code that is up on the screen right now. Or alternatively, you can do it by going to the Slido website on the bottom of the slide and key in the number 47676. You should have received a link to the Slido page upon registration of this talk, but I will leave this slide up for a few seconds so that you can scan the QR code or access the Slido's web page before we proceed to move on to today's talk. I'll quickly go through the top points for today's talk. Tommy will briefly introduce to you the obligations of parties under an agreement, the force majeure clause, frustration of contract, as well as the effect of termination of a contract. Following that, Cassandra will take over and she will talk about the renegotiation of agreements and its terms and, terms and conditions, and also the po possibility of parties to enter into a supplemental agreement. I believe that everyone here is aware of the movement control order that is currently being implemented in Malaysia. This order was, was issued pursuant to section 11 of the Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Act 1988. On the 18th of March, the PCID regulations were gazetted and both the PCID and the PCID regulations have effect from the 18th of March until initially the 31st of March, but was then extended to the 28th of April. However, the recent announcement has further extended the MCO until the 12th of May. The movement control order is an effort to contain the spread of the COVID-19 outbreak by restricting movements of Malaysians and only allowing several categories of businesses that are considered as essential services to operate. I will now leave the floor to our first speaker, Tommy. Tommy, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Felicia, for the brief introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will now sh uh, start my presentation. Um, good morning again. Well, with the implementation of the MCO and extension of the restricted movement, well, we are, we, are, we are very well aware that a lot of businesses have suffered financially and also have seen uh, its business uh, being stalled. Now, what are, certain, what are a few difficulties faced by businesses? Um, you've got financial constraints, financial burdens, financial difficulties um, because of agreements not being able to be carried out. Uh, and that is because of the restriction on movement, uh, which then results in the failure to perform obligations uh, in an agreement. Now, um, well, in light of the current situation, uh, as the slide has provided, these are common questions where many parties to commercial contracts or any types of agreement uh, for the matter to ask uh, perhaps legal professionals what they can do uh, during the, 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 the current circumstances and uh, post MCO? Well, uh, to briefly answer uh, these questions, uh, it really, really depends on uh, what the contract sets up. There are uh, many provisions in an agreement and it is very, very important to have a look at what, the, uh, what, what such provisions set out in, in an agreement. 
Uh, first, first talk point of today is the force majeure clause. What is force majeure? It, uh, it is defined as an unexpected event such as a war, crime, or an earthquake which prevents someone from doing something that is written in a legal agreement. Basically, it is when parties, uh, during, the, during the time when parties entered into an agreement, uh, they did not foresee or expect such event to occur during the course of the agreement. Many, many agreements uh, do not include force majeure uh, clauses, but it is important uh, to be included because it caters for parties to be excused from performance of their contractual obligations. In the event, any unexpected events, uh, which is beyond the reasonable control of the parties, are not anticipated during negotiation and execution of an agreement. That sets out the avenues for parties to rely on for the non-performance of their contractual obligations. Are uh, force majeure clauses standardized in agreements? Again, no, they are not. Uh, usually, agreements with a shorter term don't include force majeure clauses, and agreements with a, with a spanning a longer term uh, will include uh, these uh, such a clause, whereby it also depends on the scope of work being carried out uh, and the contractual obligations involved in the agreement and the complexity of the terms. What are the types of agreements that would typically contain a force majeure clause? Uh, sale, of, sale and supply of goods, construction contracts, and also supply of services because these are a lot of, for example, sale and supply of goods uh, involves a lot of, uh, it involves the, the, the supply and delivery of goods where the risk of property transfers from one party to, the, to, to another. So it is obviously quite important to be for, for the clause to be included. Many questions have arised uh, whether the COVID-19 outbreak or the MCO would fall within the ambit of a force majeure event, but it's highly depending on uh, the, provision, the, the provision of uh, the agreement, uh, more so the wording of the clause. Will courts adopt an interpretation of uh, COVID-19 to fall within the ambit of a force majeure event? Again, it is highly dependent on the wording of the clause. Typically, a force majeure clause would include uh, acts of God, uh, war activities, and so on and so forth. But, all, but in, in, in our current situation, uh, obviously keywords to cover and cater for the, the outbreak and also the MCO would be words such as pandemic, epidemic, disease, outbreak, Restric uh, restrictive mo restricted movement uh, and or government or governmental orders. Now, in, in such circumstances for in relation to the MCO or the COVID-19 outbreak, any party would want to want to invoke uh, the force majeure clause to cover for their non-performance of their contractual obligations would have to bear the burden of proof. How how, how do we determine whether the party who's intending to invoke the clause, and there are many considerations uh, to, be, uh, to be taken into account, such as the, four, uh, the three questions on the slide, did the clause specify the outbreak uh, and the MCO? Is the clause drafted to define uh, an, an event of force measure to be an event beyond control of the parties? Or, and also, uh, due to the current situation, were the party's obligations rendered completely impossible to be performed? In the event a force majeure clause is invoked, what, 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 would, what effect would it have on, on, on an agreement? Typically, how, how it happens is a party would provide a written notice that their non-performance of their contractual obligations uh, is due to the current situation of the MCO and the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And thereafter, the other party would provide their reasons uh, for e either accepting such notice or rejecting such grounds to, for their non-performance of obligations. If in the event, uh, for example, party A try, attempts to invoke the force majeure clause, if included in, in an agreement, and, the other, and party B does not uh, wish or intend to accept such notice, the party who intends to uh, be excused from performance of their obligations can still rely on uh, the doctrine of frustration.
Now, the doctrine of frustration is defined in the Contracts Act, Act, Contracts Act 1950 to, to be a contract to do an act which, after the contract is made, becomes impossible or by reason of some event which the promiser could not prevent and becomes void when the act becomes impossible, unlawful. There are, there are requirements to be fulfilled in order to satisfy the doctrine of frustration. It is broken into three parts. One, there must be a frustrating event uh, which was subsequent to the formation of the contract, meaning the event cannot happen prior to the formation of the contract. Secondly, the event was not due to any fault of the parties. Uh, again, this basically means beyond uh, the party's reasonable control. And lastly, the event caused a significant change to the nature of the contractual obligations and made it, made it unjust to be performed. Parties now wishing to uh, invoke the doctrine of frustration would probably ask then if the, if the outbreak and the MCO does not fall within a force majeure event, does it actually fall within the ambit of the doctrine of frustration? As the previous slide, uh, pre the previous slide has stated, there are three requirements to be fulfilled. First, you have, you have to ask, is there a frustrating event that happened after the formation of the contract? Uh, was, the, was such a frustrating event caused by either or both parties? And did such event cause a significant change in the nature of the contract, which, make, which makes it unjust to impose such obligations to be performed by parties? Now, obviously, from the face of it, COVID-19 outbreak or the MCO is a frustrating event because it, it, parties, are, parties cannot control what they can or cannot do during, during the course of an agreement because it was uh, the outbreak is in nature, like, as you can say, and the MCO is imposed by the government. So parties have no control over it. Uh, also, the COVID-19 outbreak or the MCO did not occur due to any fault by any parties at all. The final question is whether the outbreak or the MCO has changed the nature of contractual rights significantly, thereby re rendering it unjust to impose obligations to be performed by parties. Now, this question is highly dependent on the facts of each respective matter, such as if in the event uh, the term of a contract, uh, the term of an agreement is two years and the implementation and extension of the MCO is for a period of two months. That doesn't make it, uh, that doesn't significantly change the nature of the contract. Uh, just because an event made it difficult for parties to perform contractual obligations does not, it, do, it doesn't mean that the contract is made, is made frustrated. It has to, it has a threshold of uh, being impossible to perform contractual obligations, not just difficult. If it's difficult to perform, then it would likely not to be. It would likely uh, be found to be not frustrated. For example, if a tenant cannot pay rent to the landlord due to his own financial difficulties, that would likely not amount to frustration of an agreement. If if there's a significant uh, change, then obviously it would it would be more likely. And another factor to bring into consideration when going through an agreement, because it is, really, it is highly dependent on wordings of uh, the agreement, the provisions of the agreement. If there's a time clause to perform any respective contractual obligations, then, and, and for, sorry for, and if such MC, if the MCO or the outbreak has caused the delay or the impossibility to perform such obligations within that time stipulated in the, in the, in the, in the agreement, then it is more likely to be found to be frustrated. What happens when uh, the courts find that the agreement is frustrated? Well, the agreement will be rendered null and void, uh, and thereby the parties are discharged from their respective contractual obligations. This means that the, the agreement is no longer in existence, and parties are no longer required to perform their contractual obligations. So what happens when it becomes void or null and void. Uh, it also relates back to the, to the question of payment that has been made or is supposed to be made. Um, Section 66 provides for such a situation when an agreement is discovered to be void, uh, 
or it becomes void, any person who has received any advantage under the agreement or contract is bound to restore it or to make compensation for it to the person from whom he received it. This basically means that if party A has received money from party B, and if the contract is found to be frustrated, party A is supposed to refund or reimburse the money that he has received from party B to party B. Uh, Section 15 sub 2 of the Civil Law Act also provides for such uh, instance where, for example, if there is part part of the sum, for example, 50% paid by party A, paid by party B to party A, party A is obliged to reimburse the 50% that he has received from party B, and also the remaining 50% of such sums uh, will not be payable anymore as the contract has been found to be null and void. There, these are uh, case laws to govern the frustration of contracts. This basically relates back to the definition of uh, the frustration, uh, what is an event of frustration. Uh, basically, it is the, there's, a, there's a supervening or frustrating event which has occurred prior to the contract being made. And these, such event is not, uh, is not, held, is, is not uh, due to the fault of any parties. And this event has made, uh, made it very difficult for parties to perform such obligation, uh, made it very, very, imp uh, made it impossible for parties to uh, perform their obli uh, obligations under the contract. Now, obviously, uh, setting aside these two uh, talk points, we enter into the termination clause. Um, I would, it, it, is, it is important for termination clauses to be uh, included in any agreement because it sets up avenue for parties to exit their agreement if there's any uh, breach of the terms and conditions or any events of default. Now, a termination clause generally sets out the circumstances and methods of termination in an agreement. Uh, as mentioned earlier, examples of circumstances include breach of terms and conditions, events of default, uh, change of control within a party, typically companies. Uh, this relates to, for example, there's an entire change in the board of directors of a company. And if such, if such event occurs, then the other party would have the right to provide a, a notice of termination to the, uh, to the party who had uh, a change of control in their uh, board structure. Also, you have bankruptcy or insolvency of a party and uh, it is very, very important for parties to be aware of uh, any, any termination period to be included with the notice. Uh, continuing on, if there's any occurrence of event uh, that relates to a breach or event of default or any, any event stated in the, or stipulated in the agreement, um, parties have to be very, very careful to identify whether there's a specified period for a defaulting party to remedy the breach or default. Now, it is basically to mitigate any uh, cause or reason for uh, an impromptu termination of an agreement. Uh, this sets up for this sets up a, a stronger basis for the terminate, terminating party to rely on if there's any dispute or or claims arising out of such termination. Um, if the party fails to remedy or uh, rectify such breach or default, then uh, the intending terminating party may terminate the agreement. Also, uh, subject to the notice period, which was either provided in the agreement or in the written notice of uh, such uh, the written notice informing the other party of the breach or default. How how do we how how can a termination of an agreement be affected? Basically and usually, parties would serve a written notice on the other uh, the other party, uh, doing 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 such uh, with such service. Uh, obviously, parties would have to the the terminating party would have to be aware of uh, the time period for termination and also whether there's a specified method of service for a written uh, for the written termination notice to be served. For example, is an is service by email sufficient or must it be served by post or AR register post? Uh, parties have to be, parties have to carefully adhere to such instructions provided by 
uh, the provisions of the agreement. With that, I would like to conclude uh, my part of the presentation and I would like to pass it on to Cassandra. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tommy, for going through the clauses in commercial agreements. And thank you to Felicia as well for the introduction. Without further ado, I will address the next portion of this talk, which we will go into now um, on negotiation of agreements. Now, the second aspect of this is that parties um, should know that they are able to renegotiate the terms and conditions of an agreement, even though the agreement has already been executed. So the answer to whether parties can negotiate these terms and conditions of their own agreement is definitely a yes. However, this negotiations was, would highly depend on mutual consent between both parties. And it must be noted that any amendments, modifications, or variations of terms and conditions to be renegotiated must be done mutually between both parties. Now, an example of this is in the event parties do not wish for an agreement to be terminated. And both parties want to work together to renegotiate the terms, of the con terms and conditions of the agreement due to restrictions that they are unable to perform certain contractual obligations because of the MCO. Now, both parties should be able to meet halfway to renegotiate the terms and conditions, and this must be done by way of implementing it in writing. Whether the terms and conditions should, what are the terms and conditions that parties should look at to renegotiate to avoid termination would depend firstly on the parties and what their contract is. But a few areas that parties may want to take into consideration are obligations of the parties, for example, uh, delivery of certain goods or supply of services, an extension of timelines, if there are any timelines under the agreements to be met, which cannot be met during the MCO due to a restricted movement, or extension of timelines where they may have to pay a certain amount of money within a certain time frame, or any delays or payment terms. Now, these are general terms and conditions which might be included in some agreements, but may not be included in others. So renegotiation, depending on the terms and conditions of your agreement, is crucial, depending on what has been agreed to so far. Obligations of the parties. So we will go through each general terms and conditions briefly in order for you to renegotiate agreements and what you need to look out for. It is highly likely that many, if not all, contractual obligations that some of you may be going through and some of you may not, cannot be performed due to restrictions imposed by the MCO. Now, previous examples were given by Tommy where delivery of goods may be hindered, payment timelines may not be met. Now, parties can mutually agree that performance of these respective contractual obligations can resume, perhaps upon conclusion of the MCO. So say, for example, if the parties under an agreement have a clause to say that they're supposed to deliver goods within 30 days from the purchase order. Now, what can happen is it's understandable that a lot of them may not be able to deliver such goods during this time. So parties can agree to renegotiate agreements and instead add an addendum to your agreement to say that perhaps delivery of goods will be supplied within 30 days from the MCO being lifted. Now, there, that is an example of how a renegotiation of terms and conditions can be put into place. Delivery of goods and payment terms. These fall within the ambit of most contractual obligations, as most contractual obligations would have delivery of goods, and most contractual obligations also have payment of terms. Now, payment terms, however, might be, you might need to track carefully when you negotiate this in your agreement so that you don't avoid non-payment in the event that payment cannot be made due to financial constraint. Parties may want to specifically consider, perhaps, amending the agreement to reflect negotiated terms. Now, this must always be in writing because it's important that any renegotiation must be agreed to by both parties and recorded. Now, in order to do this, um, you can enter into supplemental agreements or settlement agreements, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail um, in due course. Extension of timelines and delay. Now, this is also another standard clause which might be included in most agreements. And due, again, to the imposition of the MCO, this severely may restrict parties from performing what they need to do under the agreement. Now, if parties do not renegotiate agreements in the event they are due to perform a certain contractual obligation which they cannot, they may be in breach of the agreement or they may find themselves, in some cases, paying liquidated damages. 
Now this is important because LAD, which in short means liquidated acetane damages, are found in most construction, ca uh, construction contracts and other supply and service contracts. And in the event this is invoked, it is important to renegotiate the terms and conditions so that both parties don't fall foul of the agreement. Now, with that being said, there are certain things that needs to be done in the event you do renegotiate your agreements, and this is called supplementals. Now, supplemental agreements are ways that parties can record their understanding based on successful renegotiations. And they can either do two things, which is the first thing you can either enter into a brand new agreement, which specifically sets out that the original agreement is revoked and that new terms are to be taken into consideration with the execution of a new agreement. Or the second thing which might be available as an option is you can enter into a supplemental agreement to modify, vary or amend your principal agreement. Now, what do I mean by this? So an example of a supplemental agreement is where it is essentially a secondary contractual agreement, which both parties agree to, to be signed to modify the original agreement. Now, it is very important to note that supplemental agreements do not replace the original agreement in its entirety, but it merely sets out amended clauses or new clauses that need to be included to change the wordings perhaps or certain contractual obligations in the original agreement and this supplemental agreement must be read together with the original agreement. Now supplemental agreements like I said earlier they are not standalone agreements they are executed in connection with the second uh, with the original contract to be read together so that say for example a certain term is amended what will happen is the supplemental agreement caters for that particular paragraph clause or obligation to be amended, modified, or varied. Now, there are certain examples of supplemental agreements and what would be included in them. These are things to look out for in supplemental agreements. You would have your recitals at the very top, interpretation of certain defined terms which are new in addition to the original contract, and amendments to the original agreement must be set out clearly, concisely, and specifically. Now, any additional or new clauses that are going to change the original agreement or to be included as an addition, which is not included at all in the original agreement, must also be set up clearly in the supplemental agreement. Upon supplemental agreements, it is important to note that supplemental agreements are entered into upon successful renegotiation. There is no point in preparing a supplemental agreement if both parties do not agree to the terms to be amended or varied. Now, it is important that parties document these renegotiated terms in writing. Um, a lot of the time, many companies or individuals don't find it necessary to enter into a supplemental agreement and are happy to record their renegotiation via verbal exchange. However, a lot of the time, this may not be relied on heavily in future in the event that there is a dispute. So it is always advisable that any terms which are to be varied or agreed, which are not set out in the original agreement, or which have been amended must be recorded in writing. And this can be done, like I said, by way of a supplemental agreement. This clearly helps avoid future disputes um, that may come into light down the road. And it ensures that both parties' agreements are signed, dated, and recorded. Settlement agreements can also be, be done if mutual agreement between both parties reflect an offset. Uh, what do I mean by this? So an example of this is, can parties negotiate payments or debts due and owing under commercial agreements due to financial constraint? The answer is yes. So this settlement agreement is in addition to a supplemental. So it's two different things. A supplemental agreement is where you want to amend something in the original contract, or you want to address new terms and conditions in addition to the original contract. Now, a settlement agreement is different. A settlement agreement is where parties negotiate their payment terms and debts in a different manner or in a different way. Now, again, similar to the previous uh, agreement, which is a supplemental, settlement agreements must also be done based on negotiation and mutual consent. One party cannot agree to a settlement without the other party's consent and without the other party's approval. Parties can renegotiate their payment terms to reflect an offset. 
what do I mean by this? Now, an example of this is, say, for example, a party B wishes to pay off their debt by way of offsetting their property. Now, parties must always ensure, again, similar to the supplemental, that any modification, amendments or variations, whether it's to payment terms or whether it's to other contractual obligations, must be recorded in writing, signed, dated, and recorded by way of the settlement agreement or the supplemental, depending on your circumstances. Now, this too would avoid future inconsistencies and future disputes between both parties. As explained earlier, settlement agreement reflects settlement between two parties. It could be for a debt due and owing, or it could be for other matters, depending on what the main original agreement addresses. Original agreement, an example of this is where an original agreement states that a debtor is to pay off a debt of 1 million within 24 months. After successful negotiations, a debtor and a creditor may agree to have the debt reduced and paid off by either offsetting property or to pay in a lump sum, depending on what the settlement is. To conclude what has been said so far, it is important to note that for every contract and for every uh, agreement, depending on what type of agreement or contract it is, deciphering the words for each force module clause, as well as timelines, delay and termination clauses depends on the nature of the contract. There will not be several contracts where all force module clauses are the same. They may differ significantly in terms of complexity, length, and the wording. So deciphering your wording in your contract is important. Parties should also consider renegotiating the terms of their contract when they find that it is impossible to, do, to carry out what it's supposed to do in the original agreement. Now, due to the MCO and the restrictions imposed, perhaps it might be worth taking a step back to renegotiating how their terms can be looked at to vary certain timelines or to vary certain scopes of work. Now, as said before, this is easier to do by way of a supplemental agreement, and this must be executed by both parties as well. Parties may also want to consider negotiating with uh, settlements between their creditors. Now, when I say creditors, we are focusing mainly on unsecured creditors because secured creditors will rarely enter into settlement agreements with debtors. And when you negotiate the settlement terms, it is always important, again, to record this in writing by way of a settlement agreement. We do have an update to share with all of you. And that update is that there is currently a proposed tabling of a new law um, in Malaysia to address the inability to perform contractual obligations due to unforeseen circumstances. Now, this is currently not enforced yet. It has not been prepared, but is proposed for tabling. And the proposal ha propo proposition has very much been welcomed by many for the purpose of protecting the sanctity of contracts. And it will also help shed some light and give us more clarity on forced major clauses in Malaysia in contracts to assist them to address inabilities to perform contractual obligations due to the MCO. Now, there are also suggestions that have been put forward for such new law to be modeled after Singapore, as you all know, where they have already have, they already have a bill in, in put in place to address non-performance of contractual obligations. Now, we have reached the question stage of um, our presentation today. And what we will do is I will pass the floor over to Felicia to address questions that we may have on Slido. Over to you, Felicia. Thank you, Cassandra, and thank you, Tommy. The first question that we have on Slido here, um, we will now take questions from participants from Slido. You can either scan the QR code to access the Slido page or go to slido.com and enter the number 47676 to post your questions. Our first question here, can I know the difference between the doctrine of frustration and force majeure? Uh, perhaps, perhaps, Tommy, you can address to this question. Thank you, Felicia. Uh, the fourth measure uh, clause has to be included uh, expressly in, in an agreement uh, for parties to rely on in order to, to be excused from their contractual obligations. Uh, for doctrine of frustration, it is a right provided under statute where parties can rely on and uh, to argue uh, to, be excused for, uh, to be excused from their contractual obligations as well. So force measure has to be expressly included in an agreement while the doctrine of frustration is already provided for by statute. We have questions on, um, there are addition costs in, incurred to comply with MITI's SOP 
and requirement for working within the MCO period. Can a contractor claim this cost from the client? And also, I, I believe it's a continuous question below here. MITI only allows 50% of workers to work and coupled with stringent requirements, work progress is greatly affected. Can a contractor claim for time and cost? Um, over to you, Cassandra. I think for this, this would relate to construction contracts. And under certain construction contracts, um, there is a clause to cater for loss and expenses. Now, this loss and expenses under most construction contracts will um, need, it will, it's actually, this question is actually quite subjective. So you will need to check your contract to see whether the loss and expense clause allows contractors to claim for your loss and expense, which has um, been the subject of this. So in this case, it would be MITI's SOP um, for for workers to work during the MCO period. So if the contractor wants to claim for this cost, this must be specifically set out in the loss and expenses paragraph. Now, every contract is different. The contract may differ. So you will need to review the wording of the contract. And it highly it is also highly dependable on the um, terms and condition of the construction contract to claim for any time, loss or expense. Next question. Um, due to the company financial issues, can employers take re retrenchment plan to what towards conference staff, which is which has a salary below um, 2,000 ringgit. What would be the cor correct procedure for this? Um, Cassandra? Um, so in employment contracts, if an employee is earning a salary below 2,000, that would fall under the Employment Act. Now, under the Employment Act, there is a compens compensation calculation which must be done, and it must be adhered to since the salary is below 2,000. Now, in order for this to be done, um, again, no mutual consent between employees is required, but they would have to do a VSS scheme, uh, a VSS scheme which um, should be done if they are looking to retrench staff, and this must be done before retrenchment. Thank you, Cassandra. The next question here, instead of doing a supplementary agreement, can an exchange of letters with reference to the original agreement be used? Tommy, would you like to take this? Yes, thank you, Felicia. Exchange of, uh, of letters between parties uh, to renegotiate terms and conditions uh, can be done, uh, well, it must, but it must strictly refer to the original agreement uh, as to what terms and conditions uh, are uh, removed or uh, amended or new clauses to be added uh, towards the original agreement. As Cassandra mentioned uh, earlier, terms and conditions must be specifically spelled out, uh, especially the amended ones and the new clauses as well. Uh, but obviously, it is, it is advised to, to have a supplementary agreement uh, drafted up because it is, it, it, it would read better in line with the original agreement. But to answer this question, exchange of letters can be done as it is still documentary evidence of the renegotiation between parties. Thank you, Tommy. Next question here. Do we need to stand, send for stamping again if we have a supplemental agreement? Do we need to stamp any addendums to the agreement? For example, extending of the tenancy per period. Um, Cassandra? Um, so no, not all agreements, uh, not all renegotiated terms and conditions must be recorded by way of a supplemental. It's not that strict. For extending tenancy periods, a lot of the time, a lot of people enter into a extension letter and they include it as an addendum to the original tenancy agreement. Now that's fine as long as the addendum to the agreement by way of extending the tenancy period is in writing. And as long as your tenancy does not include a term to say that if any variation or modification of this tenancy is to be done, it must be by a specific method. So if there is no specific method set out in the tenancy agreement, then a letter extending the tenancy period is fine. Uh, and know that letter does not need to be stamped. Thank you, Cassandra. So I believe this is a continuous question from Jay. Um, so there is a rental agreement that has um, a year more. However, the business wouldn't survive due to COVID uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, as this business requires social gatherings, thriving in malls, active gyms, art <sighs> exhibitions, um, for example. And however, um, now I can't, pay, uh, can't pay rent, honor the contract due to cash flow, cash flow problems. Um, Am I straight out in trouble with the landlord or do I have options? Tommy, would you like to take this? 
Well, to answer this question, um, it is again highly dependent on the provisions of your uh, tenancy agreement. Um, the question to ask is whether is there an, is there a force majeure clause uh, expressly provided for in the agreement? Uh, in the event there's the, the, there's no such clause, uh, one option for uh, J, Mr. J, to rely on could be the having a negotiation with your uh, landlord uh, to see what structure of repayment of your rental fees can be can be done. Thank you for your thoughts, Tommy. Why is there a need for a settlement agreement when the same can be incorporated in a supplementary agreement and origina originating from the same principal agreement? Cassandra, what are your thoughts? So uh, um, again, to reiterate, a settlement agreement is situations where the payment terms might be reduced and you normally do this with creditors. Uh, again, you can enter into a supplementary supplementary agreement if, say, for example, you want to amend the terms of the contract to reflect a reduced sum. And instead of doing it by way of a settlement agreement because your payment terms might be the same, you can very well do it by way of a supplementary as well. Now, the effect of a supplementary and a settlement agreement are two different things. A settlement agreement is to reflect an entirely different payment scheme under the original contract. And the settlement agreement will also stay at the very top in the recitals to say that the original agreement is hereby revoked or terminated. And therefore, the settlement agreement is going to be entered into to readdress the payment of the debt. Now, with a supplementary agreement, the supplementary agreement does not terminate the original contract. It basically just says that we're going to say, for example, the payment term says one million and the supplementary says the payment terms and the payment sum is going to be amended to reflect, say, 500,000. So in situations like that, when you don't want to terminate the original contract and you just want to change a few clauses, then it might be pertinent to think about a supplementary as compared to a settlement. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Thank you. The next question here, my tenancy agreement expires on the 30th of April. Um, my tenant has last week indicated via a phone call to extend the tenancy for another three months. Can I send an email to confirm this, Tommy? If your tenancy agreement expires on the 30th of April, uh, the first thing to look at is whether there's a notice period for your tenant to provide you in relation to the extension of uh, or renewal of the tenancy, but uh, if he's your if, if 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 he's your tenant, um, if you would like to confirm via email, that's possible too. But uh, strictly, I uh, it would it would be advisable that uh, the email is precisely states uh, refers to the conversation between you and your tenant uh, to what uh, matter it is uh, uh, pertaining to. Uh, in this in such instance, it is the extension of the tenancy for another three months, and uh, kindly do ensure that your tenant acknowledges and agrees to uh, your email confirming the extension of uh, your reference to the conversation and his or her proposal to extend the tenancy and that you, uh, you are agreeable to such extension. Thank you, Tommy. Next question here. Um, if my contract does not have a force majeure clause, can I claim for such extension of time and loss and or expense? Tommy? Um, well, this question is a bit vague, but uh, again, it is very, very dependent on uh, the wordings of the provisions for extension of time and also claiming for loss and uh, loss and or expense. Uh, it highly depends on uh, under what grounds can either party uh, request for an extension of time or to claim for loss and expense. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, sorry, if I can just add to that. Um, so for loss and expenses, it's highly dependable on whether or not it is a construction contract. Some construction contracts make separate re reference to loss and expenses. Now, in the event that loss and expense is catered for under the agreement, you need to follow the steps to see whether what you're um, claiming for is already stated out in there. It may not have a force module clause, but some construction contracts uh, stipulate that loss and expenses can be claimed for in the event of any governmental orders. Now, that could very well fall into this um, area in the event you're using the MCO and it's a valid reason as to why those contractual obligations cannot be performed. So the answer to that is if it does not explicitly have a force majeure clause, but it has a loss and expense which caters for governmental orders, then that could fall under that aspect as well. Thank you, Cassandra. Due to time constraints, we'll only be answering um, two to three more questions. 
Um, the next question here is, if I'm unable to receive services from my vendors due to um, no, there's no uh, force majeure clause due to the MCO and they're not providing any relief despite negotiations, what are my options? Um, I open the floor to either Tommy or Cassandra to answer this. Um, okay, I'll take this one. So in the event there is no force module clause, there are two things that you can do. One is you can look to your termination clause to see that if negotiations are not working out for you, perhaps an option would be to terminate. Um, now, if you do terminate the agreement, you're going to have to look under your termination clause to see whether or not there is a notice period, which must be given, and the duration for termination, which you are um, going to issue your notice for. So if it says that you, know, you can only terminate it six months or three months, then that might be a problem because that time frame is too long. So another option that you might have to do is go to the doctrine of frustration, which you might have to claim for. Um, again, if negotiations between both parties are not working out and you have to resort to trying to prove that the contract is frustrated, then that might have to be your last avenue. But again, look at the termination clause first as an option to see what you can do to terminate if you can't come to common ground. Thank you, Cassandra. Next question. Next question here. Contract of service um, has no termination clause and it has been over 10 years with um, some employee type privilege. Can we terminate this contract and what is the acceptable notice period? Tommy, would you like to take this? Um, if a contract of service has no termination clause, then um, very likely you are caught in a quite a <laughs> sticky situation. Um, to terminate, then obviously, again, in your termination uh, notice, you, you would have to pr provide your grounds for termination uh, to, the, to the other party. And to answer the question, what is, accept what is an acceptable notice period? Well, it highly depends, um, but commonly it is around three months, uh, more or less. Uh, some cases go up to uh, six months, uh, also due to well, goodwill between parties, as again, in your, in your case, it is uh, it, the, the party has been with you for more than 10 years. Thank you, Tommy. The next question we have here is, what is the difference between VSS and retrenchment? Must I opt for VSS before I can conduct a retrenchment? Cassandra. Um, now, VSS is voluntary and the offer can be made open to all or certain section of certain um, employees to accept or not. Uh, now, VSS can also be offered to specific employees. However, if you allow negotiations between employees, then the VSS then becomes a mutual separation scheme, which is an MSS. So in general, the VSS must be considered before your retrenchment comes into place. And it is the general principle to consider all options before retrenchment. Thank you, Cassandra. The last question we have here is, um, is the movement control order suffice to be deemed as a force major event? Tommy? Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, the MCO is a governmental order and uh, obviously it depends on whether your force majeure clause uh, stipulates whether it includes uh, uh, events of governmental orders or uh, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic or epidemic. Uh, if your force majeure clause states that acts of, acts of God, warlike activities, well, Currently, it is very vague. Uh, we, we, we can't say for sure whether it suffice, it, it, it is suffice and safe to say that the MCO falls within a um, force majeure clause uh, or, for example, a force majeure event. But um, it, is, it is arguable uh, because of, well, it is an event beyond the reasonable uh, control of the parties. Um, so currently, it is vague, but with the proposed tabling of the uh, uh, law in regards to uh, force majeure uh, events or clauses, then uh, things may change in the future. Um, if I could just add to that, so uh, as previously indicated in our presentation, force majeure clauses is not as of right. Uh, force majeure event is not as of right as well. It is only if your agreement stipulates uh, and is contractually provided for under your agreement that a force majeure clause is there. And that force majeure set, sets out exactly what um, circumstances are covered. Now, if MCO is not, obviously MCO is not going to be 
precisely covered as a movement control order set out in the clause. So it will only be deemed necessary to decipher the interpretation of the fourth major clause where you have situations such as uh, outbreak, pandemic. Now, these kind of words, it's still not as of right. And if both parties do not agree whether or not that it amounts to a fourth major event, um, then that is still arguable. Uh, also, lastly, just to just to add in the uh, one last question that um, uh, one of the participants asked is it, whether force measure is uh, applies to only one side or both sides of the contract. Well, um, if force measure if a force measure clause is provided by uh, by the contract, then obviously both parties are able to rely on uh, the clause because uh, both side both parties have contractual obligations. Hope that answer, answers your question. All right. Thank you, Cassandra and Tommy, for your insights. Um, if I could just add to that, I noticed most of the um, questions are either employment-related or construction-related questions. Uh, now, we have had two previous talks before, which is our employment talk and our construction talks. What we will do is we will put the links up in the chat so that you guys can um, refer to our talks, which are on YouTube and on our website as well. So if you have more questions relating to certain um, issues under construction contracts or employment related queries, um, you can go to our website and our YouTube page um, to view those videos and those talks which were pre previously given. Thank you, Cassandra. Before we conclude, uh, I have a few announcements to make. First, please join us again for our upcoming talks. On the Wednesday, the 29th of April, we have a talk on resolving construction disputes by adjudication by a partner of, of, from our firm, Ms. Christine To, and a senior associate from our firm, Ms. Hannah Patrick. And on the following Monday, on the 4th of May, we have a talk on arrest, remand, and bail during the movement control order by two associates from our firm, Ms. Vivian Fan and Ms. Mr. Wong Chi En. You may sign up the upcoming talks at our website with the link um, on the screen right here or the QR code. Secondly, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what you thought of our talk. The link to the form will be posted in the chat box here. We appreciate your feedback so that we can continue to improve our MWKA online talks series for you in the future. Thirdly, follow or like our social media accounts. You may find the links to our social media accounts in the chat box here. And fourthly, if you would like to speak with our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the telephone or video over video conference. Please fill in the form at, on our website. The link is posted in the chat box here as well. To our guests, thank you for joining us today. We hope you have found today's session informative and useful. Thank you, everybody, and see you at our next talk. Stay safe and take care.